So good morning, everybody. I hope you all have had a good weekend and you're ready for one of the last couple weeks. We only have about two weeks left, which is crazy to think of, but here we are. Fortunately, we've only got a few more concepts that we want to I'd like to discuss with you all. Today I think we will be able to finish our discussion on heat exchangers and then Wednesday and Friday we'll jump into module 11 looking at boiling and condensing. So with that I think it would be good we can switch over to notes and have a brief review of what we've discussed in heat exchangers so far. So when looking at heat exchangers, we have a few equations in our toolbox looking at for fluids that are heating and cooling, we have Q equals MCP dt. For fluids that are undergoing phase change, we have M lambda. And to apply it to a heat exchanger, thing doesn't want to move. It's a little early for the crashing. We also have our design equation. Q is equal to U A F delta T log mean, where U for most systems is equal to one over H I plus one over H O to the negative one. A is our surface area, delta T log mean is our log mean temperature driving force, which is ln delta T1 minus delta T2 over natural log of delta T1 over delta T2. And what I, I don't think I've mentioned, but I, I, I often recommend when looking at heat exchangers and heat transfer systems to always draw your exchanger in terms of the inlet and outlet flows so you have a clear idea of what a delta T1 is and what a delta T2 is. So just to kind of give you an example for a counter current flow exchanger with temperatures that look like this. We see that we have one delta T1. I don't know why it's not letting me pan. Would be THI minus TCO. And a delta T2 would be THO minus TCI. The last thing we also looked at was our F or a way to get our corrected delta T log mean. Which is a function of that Z and eta value. Where 
RC. Was a comparison of the hot over the cold. And Ada was another comparison. I can also say C equation 15.1. And you can also use C Ada figures for shell and two peat exchangers. And so with F in hand, we could then solve for our corrected delta T log mean, which is simply F times the calculated delta T log mean. And with that, we were able to fully describe our design heat transfer rate equation. I had a quick question about using like um, the that equation fifteen point one. Yes. On the homework, um, I tried to do that for f, and it gave me like a non-real answer. In that case, do you just assume like f equals one? It, yeah, you'd have to look at the the exchanger design and how it works, and that. If you look at the figures, here I'll pull one up. There are some instances where you, you'd say you have a an eta of 0.7. It'll let me draw an, a zeta and then 0.7. If you ended up calculating like a z of like 2.5 those would never intersect. And in those instances, you can get a lot of instances or issues associated with non-real answers. And so a lot of times there's typically an issue with the, the, um, the design that you have in terms of the temperatures that you have going in and out. And so, if, if you're getting that in, in the homework, I would probably recommend you double check the numbers and or if and if you're still getting it, you could come talk to me and we can take a closer look. Any other questions? All right, and then I think, Last time we spent a lot of time calculating our heat transfer coefficients. For shell and tubes. Heat exchangers. Where we looked at for the tube side, we rely on the Colburn equation. That states our new salt is equal to H I K, excuse me, D sub I over K, which equals 0 0.023. Reynolds to the point eight times Prandtl to the N. And then for the shell side, we use the Donahue equation. It states our new salt is equal to HO, DO over K, or point two Reynolds to the point six, Randall to the 0.33 and our mu relation to the 0.14 if we have significant temperature differences. 
keeping in mind when it comes to the shell side, we also have to consider this effective mass velocity. And we spent a lot of time looking at how to calculate each of those mass velocities based off of two different heat transfer areas so that we could get our outside heat transfer coefficient. Is there any questions on doing those calculations for those, for the shell side and tube side heat transfer coefficients? Uh, um, oh, you go ahead. Um, for the viscosity, uh thing is mu w uh the viscosity of water no so mu and mu w mu is the viscosity of the shell side fluid at its given t let me clean that up my pen gets a little shaky Mu W is the viscosity of the shell side fluid. At the temperature of the tube. And so if you imagine like that fluids being cooled by something in the tubes, that, that temperature might be very different than what you see in the in the bulk fluid, which means the viscosity that's going to happen at that interface is going to be different. And so it's a corrective factor associated with the change of viscosity you can expect due to the fluid mainly interacting with the tube might be at a drastically different temperature. Keeping in mind that's not a sick, it's not a a huge effect, but it is significant enough if your temperatures are pretty large. Got it. Thank you so much. Of course. Did I have another question? I was going to ask about how would we go about calculating these if we were, were not given mass flow values? Um, it really depends on the nature of the problem. I always say in those cases, you can probably just take a basis depending on what's being asked. And I think, I think this might allude to a question that you had sent me over email and that I answered earlier this morning. All right. So I think we can keep moving and continue our discussion on the ADA NTU method, where the NTUs is associated with the number of heat transfer units. In a heat exchanger. And the aid is looking at the effectiveness of a heat exchanger. And so, as I mentioned on Friday, this epsilon NTU method is really to assess the performance of an existing exchanger based 
on given process fluid temperatures and flow rates, inlet temperatures and flow rates. Meaning if I had a heat exchanger and And some tubes. And I had, let's, I don't know, fluid coming in kind of like this, and then another fluid coming in here. And I know temperature hot in, temperature cold in, and information associated with the exchanger, typically the surface area is fixed and with the inlet information I can probably calculate the overall heat transfer coefficient. The question then becomes what is T out going to be and what is T C out going to be. So it's essentially assessing the performance of hey we have this exchanger let's put it into service. What should we expect in terms of the heat transfer rate Q as well as the anticipated outlet temperatures. And so we can calculate the number of heat transfer units or NTUs as U sub A over MCP min. And we can calculate the capacity ratio, I believe, as an R value, as an M C P min over an M C P max. So looking at the relative capacity that exists within the exchanger based off of the anticipated flow rates and heat capacities. And then finally looking at the effectiveness of the, of the exchanger as a function of Q over Q max, where the maximum heat transfer rate that could exist is going to be loosely based off of the mass flow rate heat capacity N and the maximum temperature driving force that could exist in the exchanger of THN minus TCN. And so we're looking at a function of that heat capacity rate over the existing actual heat capacity rate. Just crash. Your camera zoomed out of your notes. Yeah, the program likes to crash when my computer gets hot. The problem of having a surface that's very ultra thin is the cooling solution doesn't isn't the best. And so typically means this when we're looking at min over max or actual over max. We can calculate the efficiency as TH out minus TCN over THN minus TCN. All right, so this would be the maximum heat driving force. This would be the actual driving force looking in that situation. <clears throat> And another good way that we can calculate these is based off of the information. If we have two or the three of these values, epsilon, and u, and r, we can calculate the third using a figure like you see here, where we have the number of heat transfer units on the x-axis, the effectiveness on the y-axis, and capacity ratio curves from zero to one. A typical exchanger. What page of our textbook is that on? This is on page 454. It's figure 
Thank you. Could you explain where the equation for um, Q max comes from? Like, why is it a function of um, MCP, um, like the minimum MCP? Because it's going to be your limiting factor in the exchanger is that minimum, essentially, heat transfer capacity rate governed by whatever stream has that lowest value. So it's essentially that limiting value associated with the maximum driving force that can exist in the exchanger. And it's we're looking at the effectiveness as comparing those driving forces, the, the maximum driving force associated with putting the cold and hot stream directly in contact versus the actual driving force that's seen, which is going to be the cold stream in with the hot stream out, assuming we're going to have that counter, counter current flow. So let's take a look at an example of this that we'll work through together, which states for a counter current flow heat exchanger, it's going to be used to recover heat from an oil stream at 110. The exchanger and fluid properties are shown below. If the UA value is approximately 3.89 times 10 to the third, what's the outlet temperature of the oil? given the following mass flow rates, heat capacities, and inlet stream temperatures. So we're basically using cooling water to cool this oil, going in at a flow rate of 2,400 kilograms per hour, while the oil comes in at 3,000 kilograms per hour. So let's take a look at this problem together. Okay. So for this example, of the epsilon NTU method. I have my mass flow rate of my hot stream coming in at 3,000 kilograms per hour, which converting that to kilograms per second, I got 0.83 kilograms per second. My mass flow rate of my cold stream was approximately 2,400 kilograms per hour, which is about 0.67 kilograms per second. The heat capacity of my oil was approximately 2.3 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin, which implies my MCP value here is going to be that 2.3 times 0.83, or 1.92 kilowatts. Oh, what happened? It should be kilowatts per Kelvin, I believe. Yes. Now, if we're looking at the cold stream, my heat capacity there is going to be 4.18 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin, which means my M cold, CP cold, is about 2.79 kilowatts per Kelvin.
Is that a 2.79 or 3.79? It's a 2. Thank you. So basically, MHCPH is MCP min, meaning I can calculate both my capacity ratio and my number of heat transfer units. So the number of heat transfer units that I have is going to be UA over MCP min, which is equal to 3.89 times 10 to the third, or 3.89 kilowatts per Kelvin, divided by the 1.92 kilowatts per Kelvin. where I got about 2.03 heat, heat transfer units. In terms of my capacity ratio, I have 1.92 kilowatts per Kelvin, divided by 2.79. was it? Seven, nine. Seven, nine. Thank you. I wish I knew why it would, wouldn't let me pan. Which gives me a capacity ratio probably around 0.6. 0.69. So I have my eta H and my R, which means using that figure, assuming a 1 1 counterflow exchanger, I can find my eta value. Or using figure 15.8. On page 454 for epsilon. So if I jump over to that slide, my value was about 0.2, and I had about 0.69, so basically 7.7, .7, so probably somewhere right here for. which gives me an epsilon value probably about 0 0.73, 0 0.725, 0 0.73. So let's say it's 0 0.73. Like I said, these, are, these aren't really super exact, so. And since based on my definition for epsilon, I can now solve for this THO. All right, so it's THO minus the temperature in, which was. You're still on the slide. Yeah, I'm switching it back right now. Thank you. Um, 25C was the TCN. THN was 110, TCN was 25 degrees C, which means TH out is going to be, let's see, about 87 degrees C. Is that right? I think so. 
Also, where did UA come from on the top of NTU? Where did what come from? UA. It was in the problem statement. Here, I'll show you. I guess I have an old version of the PowerPoint, so I missed that. Thank you. No problem. Yeah, this one is weird. A little bit. I think when I originally put it in, it might have had like to the fourth or something, but the numbers didn't work out. Will that just always be something you give us in a problem? Yes. Yeah, Te you could technically calculate it if you had enough information. Like if, if you had the size of the shell and the size of the tubes and everything and the number of tubes, you could do all of the, the calculations to find you. But when it comes to these types of problems, I, that, that's, that's really long. So if it's like on a, the final, I, I wouldn't do something like that. I would just give you the, the, the UA value. All right, any questions on this problem? All right, we just have a couple of more things that I'd like to discuss. One is a look on Ross flow heat exchangers. And for a true cross flow heat exchanger, you would have essentially tubes all laid out straight and then your flow would literally be directly in and out around those tubes in a perpendicular fashion. There would be no shell passes and things like that. It's pretty common for um, heat transfer systems that are involving like air so like heating or cooling with air, you, you see cross flow exchangers happening just because the heat capacity of those fluids are low. And so the heat transfer rates necessary to get reasonable temperature rises is gonna be a lot lower than what we expect for fluids. So when it comes to these types of exchangers, your inside heat transfer coefficients or your tube side flow is going to be the same thing as, as the, the Colburn equation. But for your outside heat transfer coefficient or the shell side, you're going to see an adjustment to your new salt which would be about 2.87 times, once again, your mass velocity, because you're looking at gases more often than not, to the 0.61 times your Prandtl or Cp mu over K to the 0.33 times an Fa value, where Fa, is an arrangement factor. 
associated with the layout of the tubes. And it's typically a function of two things. Your Reynolds number in your shell and this relative P to D naught value or two pitch to the outside tube diameter. And I would say C table 15.1 for these corrections. And I can show you what that looks like here in a second. I'll give you a few seconds to finish taking any notes you'd like. So you see that here in this slide 19. How that arrangement factor influences what we see with the anticipated Neusel number. So for most systems, you're going to have a, a arrangement pretty close to one, where for really large Reynolds, you might actually see a slight increase in the Neusel number. It's, it's going to be more important when you have low uh, Reynolds flow rates in that shell. So like I said, pretty close to what you see for the Donahue, just with some slight adjustments associated with the empirical values, as well as the inclusion of this arrangement factor. Now the last thing I want to talk about. Which is table 15.1 on? Yes. And it's on page 452. Thank you. Of course. Always happy to provide as much information as you would like. All right, the last thing I want to talk about is plate and frame. Heat exchangers. And they're admittedly not as common as shell and tube heat exchangers. However, with advances in technology, I'm, I'm hearing more and more about them when it comes to process operations and, and the chemical industry. Um, they operate a little different than what you see with shell and tubes. And you know, the best way I can do to describe it is to kind of jump back to the slide and, and we can look at this kind of drawing and it operates on what's known as this like I said it's a plate and frame exchanger so it operates on a plate and frame model where you have these flow compartments one for a cold side and one for a hotted side and they alternate flow and these plates are made out of metal such that the thermal conductivity or the conduction of heat through these plates is going to be relatively high. And so by alternating the cold fluid and the hot fluid, you can get really, really good heat transfer between these two fluids. However, the drawback, which you might anticipate for this system, is that you're going to have pretty reasonable pressure drops uh, when you're moving the fluid through these plates. Because the plates, as they're designed, I don't know if you can see it, but this, this metal is what's known as is, is corrugated metal. And so, see if I can draw this. Uh, these, as it flows, there's gonna be these corrugations in the frames. If you're going up down there, you're going up here. And that's a way of enhancing turbulence through these really narrow flow channels. And, a couple things can happen when it comes to that. You get really good turbulence, but the more corrugated that plate is, the greater the pressure drop 
And so you end up with a trade-off between having, you know, pretty extreme corrugations to have really good turbulence, really good heat transfer, but you also see an increase in pressure drop across the exchanger versus if you have small corrugations or pretty flat ones, you're not gonna have as an effective heat transfer, but you're gonna have a lower pressure drop. And so there's this kind of, you know, trade-off between heat transfer performance as well as the necessary energy input associated with the, the head loss through the exchanger. And so this is this system's gonna be really good for moderate temperature rises at reasonable flows. If, if you have a, a really high throughput system, you're, you're not gonna use a plate and frame because as you, you're gonna run into a system where you're gonna need way too many plates. As you can imagine, this isn't the cheapest kind of solution, but it is, it's helpful in that it's very modular. If you need to scale up or scale down, all you need to do is add more plates into the overall frame and you've effectively scaled up. And so there's good flexibility when it comes to the design in that regard. However, like I said, if, if there comes a certain point where you see some pretty good, you know, diminishing returns when it, in high throughput systems. And so there, there definitely is a point where you, you wanna have to consider, is, is this system gonna continue to work or are you gonna have to go through a more traditional shell and tube? So do you guys kind of understand a little bit of how this works? For those of you that may have been in my membranes class, this, this, this plate and frame model you've kind of seen in, in some membrane systems. But, you know, to kind of quickly summarize, it's, it's really nice and modular. Uh, the heat transfer occurs through the metal frames and the, and the hot and fluid, cold fluid alternates, excuse me. And we can kind of discuss, you know, how that changes based off, as you can probably kind of see here, this equation, which is another modification of the Nusselt number, which is 0.37, Reynolds to the 0.67. I don't know why there's two decimals there. Times Prandtl to the 0.33. A couple things to keep in mind when it comes to this. Is one, here I'm gonna jump back to the notes. And rewrite that expression. For a plate and frame, there's no tube side and there's no shell side. There's just a hot side and a cold side. So this equation works for both sides. They're applicable for both fluids and the exchanger. A couple, another thing you'll notice is that there's no inner or outer diameter, there's an effective diameter, which for most plate and frames is going to be approximated as two times the plate spacing. And finally, when for those interested in looking at pressure drop over the plate and frame, it follows our equation that we had in terms of skin friction to f rho u squared l over d. However, the friction factor is calculated using an empirical relation, 2.5 times Reynolds to the negative 0.3.
So any questions on plate and frame? They're a really good alternative to shell and tubes for the right applications when you can. But the way they operate's pretty different than what we see in a shell and tube. All right, so we're, we're a little low on time. Now, I, I did have an example prepared that I wanted us to go through this uh, example five in the lecture slides. What I will say that this example is in the text on page 457 through 459. So if you wanna kind of learn a little bit more to kind of work through this example, I strongly recommend you, you read the section on plate and frames, 455 through 457, um, and then work through this example using the book as a guide. And if you have questions in terms of how to do some of the calculations associated with finding the overall heat transfer coefficient, the pressure drop, and the number of plates needed, uh, feel free to come by my office hours. And if you guys really want, I might be able to post a video of me working this in terms of a short video, if you think that will help. I think that would help, actually. All right. I'll make it on. I put it on my to-do, and I'll try to get it done at some point today or tomorrow. Thank you, Dr. Lopez. Happy to. Oblige. All right, any questions on heat exchangers? That about wraps it up. The, the book does go into a little bit more detail on, on 460 to 480. However, what we've discussed here are, are the real big principles associated with, you know, the shell and tube systems, as well as the key concepts around the design equation and the, uh, um, what is it, the, Epsilon NTU method. All right, and if you guys don't have any more questions, feel free to give me um, an email, come by office hours. I will jump over in about 10, 15 um, to answer any questions about homework. I imagine you guys have, have a couple as you're finishing up that homework uh, 10. But if not, I hope you guys have a great day and you have a great week. And I will see you again on Wednesday. Thank you. Right. Bye, guys. Take care.